welcome to make us hosts to start the recording Wilma. I just started the recording and I'm upgrading you now. Upgrade me. I've been upgraded. <laughs> I will uh, stop my screen share. And uh, oh, it was stopped. Okay, so uh, Dee Dee, are you able to share the yours slides? Let's find out. And while she's taking care of business there, uh, I'll go ahead as moderator. My name is Laura Geckler, and I'll be moderating this session. Today is Thursday, June 18th, 2020, and we are in day four of the Open Apparel Virtual Conference. Before we begin, the few reminders. This session is being recorded. You'll receive an email announcement once the recordings are available. If you have any questions or comments throughout the session, type them into the chat area and we'll hold them for the end. Uh, and you could also use your microphone at the end. Uh, we do ask that you mute yourself right now if you're not speaking in order to avoid extraneous background noise. The presenters for this session are Julen Sharp and Dee Dee Hurricane. Dr. Julen Sharp is the Assistant Vice President of Information Technology for Marist College, and she oversees the digital education and web teams. Julen holds a bachelor's degree in education and Spanish, a master's degree in instructional technology, and a doctorate in educational leadership. Her research focuses on transitioning instructors to online classroom. More importantly, she's pinch hitting today for Jamie Lynn Bishop, who had a last yes, minute conflict. So thank you, Julen. No problem. I'm happy to Dee Dee. be here. Yeah, uh, we appreciate it. Thank you so much. Dee Dee, as most of you know, has over 12 years experience in building improvements and technical solutions into teaching and learning. She's a long-term community member with multiple community projects and events. Um, she's on the Pro Sakai Project Management Committee, better known as the PMC, and she's an Imperio mentor. Additionally, Dee Dee works with international graduate students through the Sakai QA process. She teaches them about open source software and global communities. Dee Dee holds an MA in Integrated Marketing and Communication from Marist College. She was selected as an Aperio Fellow in 2017, and currently she holds the position of Manager of Instructional Technology, also at Marist, Marist College in Poughkeepsie, New York. I just like saying Poughkeepsie. Nevertheless, please welcome Dee Dee and Julen. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for coming to Digital Badges and Developing Skills for Success. Again, allow me to thank Dr. Julian Sharp for joining me on this presentation as Jamie Lynn Bishop got um, other duties as assigned. All right. So we're going to get started. Just give me a second. I'm pulling up our things. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about digital credentialing and why badging. So digital credentials have been around for a long time and Marist had um, was kind of slow in taking on the the digital badge um, uh, scene. We'll put it that way. And um, they were interested in how they could leverage digital credentials to inspire a learner to um, build different skills and have a repository, but they weren't really sure how to do it. So there's a variety of ways that schools map badges. Some of them use them um, and they aim at undergraduate students and they look at badges for skills building up to a bachelor's degree. Some go through a third party company and, you know, badge different skills. There are groups that work with another company, an external company, um, to badge particular skills. Marist actually has a close partnership with IBM and we've worked collaboratively to badge some of our IDCP courses in conjunction with IBM. Um, and so digital credentials, what we've been working to do is really um, build a consistency of um, data, 
and credentialing that can be viewed by the job market um, and that can be verifiable. So we're also looking at the digital badge process. So what we had to do at first was start to actually build badges. Um, we had to do account creation. We had to design them. We had to really think about what the requirements would be, which, you know, you think about digital badges and you think, oh, well, um, we could create digital credentials pretty easily. But when you start to really think about what requirements there are on the back end of these digital badges, it becomes a little bit more complicated. And you also have to think about the outcomes. So, you know, how many people are actually going through your digital badges? What is the percentage of people who are receiving them? Um, how many people pick them up and actually use them? And, you know, what can we do from there? And then also our future plans. Um, as we all are aware, our institution has been plunged into the fun of COVID-19, as I'm sure all of your institutions have been as well. And so we're looking at our, our future plans for digital credentialing and what does that look like for Marist as a whole? While researching this project, this presentation, I found, according to LinkedIn, that 69% of the professionals think that their skills are more important than their college education when they're going for a job interview. And almost 76% of these professionals just wish there was a way for hiring managers to verify that they have those skills so they could stand out among other candidates. And so when we started to take a look at digital badging and why it was so important, we looked at a variety of things. The first thing we looked at was digital micro credentials. Um, and if you look through the research, it shows that they've become a valuable commodity to people. We were also looking at professional development for not only our adult students, but also for our faculty and staff. Uh, we chose Credly Acclaim as our digital badge vendor, and we had done a lot of research on a variety of platforms, and we had also actually looked into building it from open source, but we found that uh, Credly Acclaim was a verifiable product that would do what we needed it to do. Um, and so when we started looking at implementation at Marist, we looked at a variety of platforms as well. We looked for uh, faculty members who were our faculty champions to potentially start using this in their classes. So our School of Communications, one of our faculty members, uh, Jennifer Robinette, who you may have seen, she's done some presentations for uh, the Sakai Virtual Conference and some other things as well. She was eager to jump on board with us and start to look at digital credentials. We also have a uh, School of Professional Programs at Marist that caters to mostly adult non-traditional learners, and they were very interested in micro-credentials. And we also looked at IDCP, which is for credentials for the adult professional in technology. And those are the ones that we did in partnership with IBM. And so we were really looking at three different schools of thought, one for undergraduates who were traditional students, one for undergraduate and graduates who were non-traditional students, and then another for the professionals. So we did a pilot. And we piloted with the School of Communications. And what we really did was used it as a motivating tool for the students. They could get some digital badges based on skills for various public speaking things. Um, and as you can see from the uh, data that you see on the chart, as we moved forward, the amount of badges that we've been issuing has grown. So when we look at administering badges, Dee Dee's going to talk a little bit about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, administering badges, uh, we thought would be a simple project. We, we really did. We just make these little PDFs um, and throw them up online and students get them if they meet a criteria. And that was how we thought it would be at first. Um, it is not as simple as that. Um, creating a badging collection, um, training the badge issuer, 
support during that entire time frame of actually delivering and issuing the badges um, is not as simple as it seems. Uh, we ran into a, a problem where the students or the uh, badge issuer, are, are, uh, whether a faculty member or administrator, if they had to also do the marketing of the badging on top of it, they found that the process took a longer period of time. Um, so for example, on the screen, we can see that they, the badge issuer had to determine what the skills were. They had to define what their program was, what's the metadata behind it, define their outcomes. Um, but if they don't have to do a landing page and if they don't have to do any marketing, like Jennifer Robinette, she's doing it within her course and able to speak about it in there, it's a much faster process. If they're following all of the uh, credentials requirements, they would have to go to the end and that can take a considerable amount of time. So example, as you can see here, this is easy. So we have the organization set up. We've got uh, building a landing page, um, doing a badge development program, and all of that has to be done prior to actually deploying the badges to even be allow the public to be aware of them. The data preparation at the end is um, a CSV file, which is quite complicated. I'll give you a sample of that in a moment. Um, Launching it on their website, the timing of that uh, and having an entire marketing plan behind it built out beforehand makes it much less easy. The badge issuance and support is what digital education in our department is how we support that badge issuer. Um, for example, on the screen here, you can see that we're giving a sample timeline that Credly had offered. Now, the the launch of the badging page on your website is after you've built the badge as a PDF, what it looks like, built the artwork. Um, that is after you've built the credentials, the details that go behind it, the outcomes. And then you put this on the web page and then you get to the branding part where um, they have a timing of two weeks and I believe that it took much longer for us to reach that goal. This is an example of a digital landing page that we have for the School of Professional Programs at Marist College. Um, the screen makes it slightly wider than uh, it is in real life. But as you can see, it had to meet the branding then of the institution. So the institution, that meant we had to work with the marketing department. Did they find that the badge met the criteria of what they felt was beautiful enough to be on their pages? Not only did the um, outcomes and the requirements have to be met, but did it meet the institutional values? This page is the Institute for Data Center Professionals. This is the landing page that had to be built prior to them deploying their badges. Now they had done their badges in conjunction with uh, IBM, so they're dual credentialed. This took a very long amount of time because there had to not only be a contract with, for dual listing it, but additionally they had to build out their page and the requirements with an external client. So uh, the time frame on that took upwards of almost six months on top of designing the badges so that they also met IBM's requirements. This is a sample of the badge um, details and components. When you are on Credly, you'll have to put in, should you choose to use that platform, but you'll have to define a badge name, a badge description, uh, the skill tags, what skills are the, uh, are, are the end user receiving? This is where we're verifying that the end user is getting the skills we promised and that they've met that criteria. Additionally, we have the badge um, URL criteria, which uh, in this case, this is IBM and uh, IDCP's uh, badge components. Um, you know, what was the steps? What grade did they have to meet? And what is the next steps? Because quite often these badges are built in conjunction where there's a first level, a second level, a third level, and then an overall certificate badge that they receive for completing all of those items, which puts them at a different level. This is easier in when people are uh, giving text, uh, excuse me, technical skills, because technical skills, you can define them easier. Uh, the, it's, it's slightly harder to do those, such as Jennifer Robinette did, for the skill sets that are um, less concrete. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we found it took several iterations for the clients to really um, hone in on what the credentials were and what the expectations were. Here in the badge deploying, this is the components for every badge deploying uh, 
so every person, every administrator who we've given this ability to um, has to fill this very text heavy CSV file, um, uh, which is uploaded to Credly to deploy the badges when people have received them. Um, as you can see, it looks terrible, but it's not. Each department does have to keep track somewhere of the badges that they deployed and the people who have met the criteria. But this particular um, Excel web sheet basically um, <laughs> scares your end users very, very much. They're like, I have to do this. And that's where most of the training comes in, which is to hold the hands and not be afraid to meet that criteria. Um, we also had to go through to the um, to our badge issuer and let them know that the, what what are these benefits that the um, that the end user, their student, or uh, the person who gained those skills, will have a way of sharing their abilities that they got from these classes with their peers. Um, if you haven't been on LinkedIn lately, uh, there are badges flying through all over the place. Um, it also allows them to, especially in this time frame when we have a large job market opening up uh, because so many people are unemployed, they want to prove that they have these skills. Then employers can verify it, peers can verify it. And the platform also offers, surprisingly, um, a job search engine behind it so that you can, they, they can be matched with those skill sets with an employer. And so as we take a look at badge notifications, um, one of the pitfalls of digital badging is that uh, a, a student or professional could go through the whole badge process, they could earn the badge, and then they fail to pick it up. So according to Credly Acclaim, um, if you have a 50% acceptance rate, you're doing pretty well. Um, this task falls on, you know, the the badge issuer and the badge receiver. So what we've done is looked at ways to remind students that they have a badge, they're ready to pick up so that they remember to go in and actually claim their badge. Um, you can write your own subject line in these emails that are sent from the system. It can look like it's coming from your organization. Um, and in this world of cybersecurity, we, have to be very explicit when we tell students, you know, you really do want to go in here and click and get your digital badge because they're seeing a lot of um, uh, phishing attempts coming through. So let's take a look at our badge creation process. Uh, what we did was we really went through a process of talking with the client, really gaining a client's ideas and vision, um, along with the criteria and the key items for the digital badge. And it's a lot of times it's very difficult to really put into artwork somebody's thoughts and vision. So what we would typically do was create something the client would come back and review it, and it would go through multiple iterations of design process. And we'll show you some of those in a minute. Um, but once we've fleshed that out, we will um, take a look at the acceptance of the badge, and then we would upload that design into the system. We wanted to show you just a few quotes uh, from Dr. Jennifer Robinette, who's one of our professors over in the School of Communications. Um, so she's been issuing badges for a little over a year. She's issued 152 with a 57% acceptance rate, and she uses them basically really to motivate her students. And uh, you can see the iterations that her digital badges went through. There are three of them right here. These are credentials for her communications classes, and depending on what she was uh, talking about at the time, what skills they were gaining depended on what um, badge they got. Originally, they were just getting that badge on the left, the communication campaign management, and then as she moved forward, she created more concise uh, badges. Uh, the next one is the School of Professional Programs, 
and the one on the far left was our first iteration and then the one on the far right is the one that we ended up with. So it went through a, a process. And again, with the School of Professional Programs, we had to make sure that it was branded appropriately as well. Our School of Professional Programs also uses stackable badges. So these badges, you saw level one in the slide previous, this is a level two badge. And again, the one on the left was our first iteration and it kind of moved forward to that one on the far right, which was our final. Um, but these can actually stack on top of each other. They can earn a level one badge and then earn a level two badge. They can get to a level three and ultimately a bachelor's degree. So if you take a look at the next slide, we're looking at the various levels. Um, you can see one of them is organizational leadership level one and one is organizational leadership level two. And this is what an employer would see if they clicked on somebody's badge who had this. It's just a snapshot. Um, there was a question in the chat about whether or not you can add um, evidence to support the, the badge and you can, it's one of the uh, options in the badge creation to allow students to add evidence to support their badge. Um, but it allows employers to really get an idea of what skills this person has earned. IBM's IDCP co-branded digital badges follow the same model. They have a, um, a three-level, three-tiered badge. And at the end of it, they get a fourth uh, badge that signifies that they've completed a certificate. The, that's the square badge in the lower left. Um, they also had events and of those events they made uh, what was called the New York City um, badge for a one-day event where they would still gain the same skills as a portion of their level one badge. So it went towards this, uh, this badge creation process. Thinking these things through, it's, it's very careful to speak with the client to be sure that they understand that randomly adding badges can take away value um, from the badges that, that, that are currently being deployed. But as you can see all the way on the right hand side that um, if you follow LinkedIn and do anything having to do with IBM, their uh, badges are constantly uh, being deployed. Um, Taking as we're a look at, oh, sorry, go ahead, Didi. <laughs> I'll grab this one. Um, uh, as we're gearing up for the fall, we created 25 badges with the expectation that we're going to be training about 900 faculty. And this crisis has offered an opportunity for us to really um, reach out to our end users um, and give them skills that we would really like them to have. In this case, we have a certificate level one. This is simple. This is the new tools in iLearn. This is the iLearn rubrics. Um, it's innovative content development and design with quality standards. And so as we move on, we also have a certificate track called Innovate Your Digital Course Design. And what we've done is really, we've worked in collaboration with academics and put together a variety of workshop series that could culminate in a certificate track digital credential. And by working with academics, uh, we were able to talk about the skills that, you know, we think that they would need on the, you know, digital education side, but also um, from the pedagogy side, what academics feels that they should be getting. Um, again, we did go through an iterative process with the badge designs um, and also with the various uh, certificates themselves. Post-COVID, we're looking at a hybrid return to school, and so student engagement is very important. We had a student engagement track. We also had a track to optimize their face-to-face -face time. We're looking at, you know, the potential that only a fraction of the students are going to be in that face-to-face -face time, and they're only going to be in there once, maybe a week, instead of the, you know, three hours that they typically would. So how do you really optimize that time you have with your students? Um, hybrid 49 is the 
way that Marist has previously branded their hybrid courses. And so for faculty who are new to this hybrid design of teaching, they might need to uh, take a look at our workshops within that track to be able to um, meet the needs of their students. And Dee Dee then talk a little bit about building outcomes. We have I, four minutes. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Give me, give me two. Um, I just want to talk about outcomes. There's an increase in digital credentials. Educause is paying attention in the education design labs to get badges. They've given out awards for this. But these are the, uh, the stats on the screen which show um, how increased uh, digital badging and credentials is moving. IBM did a case study this quarter um, that where they've shown 120% increase year over year of digital badges being deployed. So it is the hot topic for the season. Um, and I will, we, we currently at Marist have deployed 587 digital badges, which is, um, and 66% of them are on social media. We would talk about the seven deadly sins, but I think we should answer your questions. Let's go. Uh, portfolios to the badge. So yes, like I said before, um, the badge at, at creation, it allows the student or uh, the person issuing the badge to add portfolios to it. So they can um, add something to it if they want to be able to show that to their employer or a future employer. Three minutes, next question. <laughs> I see one about competency-based education. And so, um, Right now, the way that Marist functions is mostly on um, objectives-based. So we are moving into the competency-based education world. And yes, digital badges could be used for competency-based education. Some of our external clients use badges for competency-based education. For example, um, one of the hospital groups in our local area asked us to build a course with a badge for them on something that was required by the state. And so we built a competency-based education model where they progressed self-paced through some thing that they had to get a certain percentage on and then the badge was issued. So if this, if my screen is showing correctly right now as a badge earner, I'm yeah. show, showing a display from Credly of my badges. Uh, so you can see a couple from Educause right there in their branding. You can see one from Notre Dame Ed tech trends we used almost exactly the way you're talking about Marist using them. Um, this was not so much for faculty development that intrigues me. We tried it that way, but more of our ed tech people went through the program than our, our faculty did. There was something in the chat that made me think about how this would work in these COVID times uh, where instead of taking a whole semester, someone might try and string together several badges so that if it, anything untoward happened, you would at least have a demonstration of some of, of that you'd earn, you'd progress towards some of the goals of the entire course or program. Have you thought about that, jo Julian? Yes, so um, Jennifer Robinette is the one who does our School of Communication and Arts badges and she does them throughout the semester. And so what she does is um, she takes portions of her course and, and badges those. And that's why you were seeing like multiple different topics. And it actually, for her, motivates her students to do various things because they're earning these basically skill sets throughout the semester-based course. Very nice. Thank you so much for this presentation. No we have thoroughly enjoyed it. Glad that our participants could join us. Uh, this is 1240, so we will be uh, stopping the uh, recording. I'm not sure who, uh, here we go. I can stop the recording.